Good afternoon and welcome to this uh, final plenary session of the day, um, which is entitled A New Vision for the Mekong Region. My name is Justin Wood. Uh, I look after the Asia Pacific region for the World Economic Forum, and it's my great pleasure to be moderating uh, this plenary. As the name of the title suggests, we want to be able to spend the next 45 minutes uh, engaging with five of the leaders from the Mekong um, to hear their thoughts on how they see the future of the Mekong. And I thought I would set the scene just by sharing with you a few facts that I think might surprise you about uh, the size of the Mekong. As I'm sure you all know, it's, there are five countries, um, Cambodia, Laos, uh, Myanmar, Vietnam, and Thailand. And collectively, these five countries uh, have a population of 240 million people. So if the Mekong was one country, it would be the sixth biggest population in the world. It's a lot of people. If you add up the GDP of the five countries of the Mekong region, it would come to 800 billion US dollars. If the Mekong was one economy, it would be a G20 economy. In fact, it would be the 19th biggest economy in the world. If you add up the combined value of exports from the five Mekong countries, they would come to $466 billion. The Mekong, if it was one country, would be the ninth biggest exporter in the world. So clearly, the Mekong region is very significant. But it would be wrong to think of the Mekong at this stage as one economy, because historically, these five nations have not been particularly integrated. I think it would be fair to say that they have not yet fulfilled the full potential that they might achieve of economic integration. If you look at something like exports, the share of exports coming out of the Mekong countries that go to other Mekong countries is only 8% of the total. So 92% of those exports go elsewhere in the world. If you compare that to the European Union, it's 70%. So the European Union, 70% of its exports go to other European Union countries. In the Mekong, it's only 8%. So that's an indication that it's not yet particularly integrated on trade. If you look at the value of foreign direct investment going into the Mekong countries, only 4% of it comes from other Mekong countries. So clearly, again, it's an indication that uh, these countries are not yet investing heavily uh, in each other. So, Yes, these countries are geographic neighbors, but they're not yet deeply integrated. Uh, and one of the things that we want to explore during this session is how that can be changed and what the vision for integration might look like. There are, of course, many master plans and frameworks that have been developed over the years to try to build a more integrated Mekong region. In the background, of course, we have the ASEAN uh, integration process, the ASEAN Economic Community, and all five Mekong countries are part of that, so that's clearly um, something that's trying to build and bring these countries closer together. But then there are specific plans. Uh, in 1992, for example, the Asian Development Bank launched the Greater Mekong Subregion, which also includes uh, South China, uh, and has been working steadily on trying to build connecting infrastructure and so on. And that plan from ADB, I think, is, is one of the most significant that's at work in the region. More recently, in 2003, under the guidance of Thailand, um, we had a new framework called ACMEX. Uh, ACMEX um, is an anagram of the three great rivers uh, running through the region, the Ayawadi, the Chao Phraya, and the Mekong. Um, and uh, it's another way of trying to frame the issues tied up in integrating and bringing these five countries closer uh, together. Uh, most recently, we saw China join in with its own framework, uh, the Lanching Mekong Cooperation Framework. Um, and again, it's another effort to try to stitch the region more closely together uh, in economic terms. So today, um, I'm delighted to have with me five uh, of the leaders um, of the region. Um, we have to my immediate left, um, Wan Suan Phuc, the Prime Minister of Vietnam. We have um, Samdek Teko Hun Sen, the Prime Minister of Cambodia. 
We have uh, Tonglun Sisalith, the Prime Minister of Lao PDR, um, Aung San Suu Kyi, State Councillor uh, of Myanmar, um, and we have Prajin Juntong, Deputy Prime Minister of Thailand. So a perfect cast to answer some of these um, big questions. To get the discussion underway, um, I'm going to start um, with Prime Minister Fook um, and work our way down the line. And I want to ask you, when you think about the Mekong and you think about bringing these countries together, what's your vision? How do you see these countries fitting together in a way that is bigger than the sum of the parts? What's your vision? What would you like to see this Mekong uh, region look like as these economies come together? Prime Minister. Excellencies, leaders of the Mekong countries, distinguished uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me to answer the first question. ASEAN is unity in diversity, and it is very clearly reflected in the Mekong framework as well. We have the differences in the starting point, in the history, but the common vision is peace, stability, integration. And especially with the uh, advent of the fourth industrial revolution, the uh, connectivity and the sustainability is also very important. We also understand that it is the common interest of the Mekong countries of uh, businesses that is the vision will contribute to the development to the ASEAN community building. Our five countries should reinforce peace, stability, and development in the Mekong region and the development of ASEAN countries. Thank you, Prime Minister. Um, uh, Prime Minister Hun Sen, maybe uh, your thoughts on how you would like uh, this Mekong vision to develop. And maybe if I can, I can ask you, how do you see uh, the differences between the countries? Because many of the Mekong nations, um, uh, your economies produce similar things. Just to give you a very uh, basic example, um, you all produce rice. Um, and so as rice producers, you are competing with each other. But where do you see potentially differences where these economies can complement each other rather than compete with each other? Thank you for the question. Uh, the uh, question is good. Uh, uh, Answer many. We can see the situation of the Mekong country, and like Excellency Prime Minister Nguyen and Fook mentioned already, ASEAN start from a, a different condition. And I think I expect that ASEAN will be successful at the time that Mekong countries develop. The initiative, uh, the integration of ASEAN start between the big gap, those who live the Mekong riparian country with the old ASEAN countries. I can see that uh, if you talk about the economy, the five country, five uh, Mekong riparian country have a similar product. But that does not mean uh, the similar product uh, it's on like the competition, but it's com so complementary. Let I say, for example, uh, uh, lately, if we only review the trade between Cambodia and Vietnam, between Cambodia with Thailand, we can know that our country are complement each other, even though we have a similar product. The vol through volume, trade volume between Cambodia and Vietnam in more of uh, 4 billion US dollars per year. And the uh, trade volume between Cambodia and Thailand is around 6 billion US dollars per year. So it means that we are not just competing with each other, but we are also complementing each other. Besides that, Laos 
uh, can be considered the the batteries of the Mekong countries, and and we talk uh, further than that. Laos has capacity enough capacity uh, to have to connect electricity to uh, 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 among other countries. So that is the complementaries uh, rather than competing each other. Another point I still remember my idea that at the time we start to the inception of ADMEC, I also persuade a country in ADMEC, we should set up an association of rice exporting association countries. So since then, since 15 years already, that uh, association, uh, the rice export uh, countries association cannot be established. I think if we could establish this uh, rice export uh, countries association, then we are not only competitor, but we cooperate with each other in order to promote the agriculture sectors, which become the bow of Asia. Um, Prime Minister uh, Tonglun Sisalith, uh, your vision for uh, the Mekong region and, and how you see uh, the differentiation of, of Laos and how it fits with, the, with your neighbors. I um, agree with the views of Prime Minister of Nguyen Xuân Phuc and Prime Minister Hun Sen that the Mekong member countries, the five Mekong countries, are one. Together, we support each other and we address issues and challenges uh, together. We've done this for the past oh, years. And I am of the view that the five Mekong countries in this region, we, we are good friends and we love each other. We, are, we cherish the Mekong River that we share that has benefited the peoples of our countries. So the countries in the Mekong region share the same interests. And we have seen creation of uh, various re uh, mechanisms, such as MRC, GMS, EGMEX, CLMVT, and Mekong Lanzang Cooperation Framework. We also have Mekong Japan and Mekong Korea mechanisms and Mekong Mississippi Cooperation. All these mechanisms have been established with the aim to uh, enhance cooperation between these uh, member countries. So I think Mekong countries should continue to cooperate. And competition is good. We should, we should encourage competition, but not to compete each other, but rather to be mutually supportive, uh, support each other, and to develop together. So we should go towards this direction of mutual support and cooperation. We should protect the Mekong River to be a river of sustainability where we all, all member countries together protect the uh, environment and together we develop. We should not think that one member country is trying to use the Mekong River for its own interests uh, only, but this is for the interests of all Mekong uh, countries. That's my view. Thank you. Prime Minister, if I can have a, a, a follow-up question. Uh, uh, Prime Minister um, Hun Sen, uh, in his comments, uh, suggested that the, the, one of the unique things about uh, Lao and your economy is the, uh, is the fact that you have very strong hydroelectric capabilities uh, and that you have the potential to become the battery um, of the Mekong region and perhaps even further by exporting your electricity. 
Um, I wanted to ask, if I may, a question about, we know in July you had a setback when one of your dams um, collapsed whilst it was being built. Um, can you tell us, has, has this impacted at all the schedule that we should expect for the development of your electricity uh, and your electricity exports? Has this changed the outlook for Laos' um, possibility to be uh, the battery of Southeast Asia? Thank you, Justin, for this good question. I, I was expecting this question for Laos. Uh, the, the, this um, saying about Laos becoming a battery of the of ASEAN uh, came from um, a, an article of a magazine that wrote about this uh, many years ago. They did a study, Mekong tributaries in Laos. Uh, present opportunities for development of hydroelectricity in Laos to be used for development and production and also export to neighboring countries. And they even said that Laos can one day become a battery of Asia or ASEAN. But I don't agree with their assessment. I explained it before that Laos cannot become the battery of Asia because our capacity to develop electricity in Laos compared to the demand of ASEAN countries, uh, neighboring countries, is very limited. But Laos has the capacity to leverage this potential uh, in terms of water resources in Laos we can produce electricity that is sufficient for Laos and that can be exported to our neighboring countries. The use of electricity within the country, as opposed to uh, exporting to neighboring countries, we have been able to, to achieve two-thirds of our um, capacity we have been exporting electricity to Thailand. Thailand is our biggest uh, consumer. And, and also Vietnam and Cambodia also buys electricity from Laos. However, of course, building hydropower uh, dam uh, projects in Laos should be done based on a well-studied and well-planned um, study approach. We have to ensure that we comply with international standards. The study of a project should be based on scientific information and uh, experts' views. Laos has about over 50 uh, hydropower dams across the country. The the dam, the saddle dam of the dam in Atapu province that collapsed, the, the saddle dam is part of the dam project in Atapu. Uh, it's a project that's un, still under construction, but the saddle dam collapsed. We, in terms of electricity development, we have this commitment to make sure that from now on development of hydropower projects should be based on careful planning and uh, good design and we have to ensure uh, socio-economic um, aspects and the impact of the project, potential impact of the project on the society uh, in terms of project development, big or mega projects have to invite, we have to invite uh, stakeholders, regional and international stakeholders to join us in the study of the per, uh, feasibility of the projects, uh, such as under the MRC framework. 
of the Sepian Senam Noape hydropower dam that uh, we're talking about in Atapu prov province. This one has not been completed and it has not started uh, exporting electricity. However, after the incident in July in Atapu province, we have announced the suspension of all new projects, new hydropower dam projects. And we are also in the, uh, inspecting uh, uh, those projects that are under construction. And we have also invited experts to come and investigate the reason behind the collapse of the Saddle Dam. However, building a hydropower project is a good way to generate income. It, it is a good way to generate renewable and clean energy. And uh, we have good model projects that uh, in Laos, such as Nam Tun Tu hydropower dam project. Uh, this was a project that was that started many years ago with the support of many parties such as the World Bank and other financiers it it has made great achievements so we have learned a lot from this uh, project and also the incident in Sepian Sinam Noi project a uh, dam project the impact of the incident in July is something that we will continue to take into account in uh, in moving forward in terms of our hydropower um, uh, production. Laos will still continue to study other options of renewable and clean energy, such as solar panel and wind turbine, um, in terms of sources of uh, electricity production. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. Um, uh, Do Aung San Suu Kyi, um, perhaps I can ask you the same question in the sense of how do you, what's your vision for the Mekong and what's your view of Myanmar's role um, and perhaps the differentiations of Myanmar within that vision? Well, actually, physically speaking, we're very much on the periphery of the Mekong, but because of our shared cultural and historical experiences, we feel that we are an integrated member of the Mekong family. It occurred to me, listening to the other panelists, that there are lots of C's in, involved, competition, cooperation, complementarity, common challenges, climate change. These are all the things that we are facing now. And I think this will give us a very, very good chance to cooperate. Uh, with regard to the complementarities, from Myanmar's point of view, for example, we were thinking of buying electricity from Laos, but we have been warned that perhaps we shouldn't rush into this. And at the same time, we're exporting natural gas to Thailand. <laughs> and uh, uh, so I don't think we have to be afraid of competition. It occurred to me that rice, we are rice exporting countries. At one time, Myanmar was a rice bowl of the world. And then, of course, we were, our place was taken by Thailand, and then Vietnam came into the picture. But that has not stopped us being, uh, from reaching our pre-war level of rice export last year. But that has not affected the rice exports of either Vietnam or Thailand. The fact that we have been gaining our position in the world rice market does not mean that the markets of Vietnam and uh, Thailand have shrunk. So I don't think we have to be afraid of competition, provided we take advantage of the um, opportunities offered by an elastic world market, a market with a certain amount of elasticity, I wouldn't say elasticity, as well as uh, the human predilection for diversity. We don't have to produce exactly the same things. Even if we produce rice, our customers are different from the customers of Thailand and Vietnam. And I don't think either Thailand or Vietnam are particularly nervous about the fact that our rice exports are going up. Now, uh, if we think of our uh, common culture 
her heritage. This is something that we can exploit commercially as well. Another C coming in, lots of Cs, as I said, it occurred to me, because we could arrange the kind of tour groups that were taken, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, Myanmar, and uh, this would be one cultural group. Vietnam is slightly different from us, but still it is close enough and could be part of the cultural programs. And uh, also, climate change, Laos, we were talking about what happened in Laos. We also have been suffering from tremendous floods over the past couple of uh, months. And I think this is something we all have to face together. Myanmar is considered one of the uh, countries in the world which most is most vulnerable to the effects of climate change. And we have our neighbors who will be facing the same problems. We could face them together and we could help each other. And that's where uh, cooperation and facing common challenges come in. Uh, so I think, uh, as I said, the, physically on the periphery of the Mekong, I think we could work together and make this not just a commercially, economically vibrant region, but a region that could, uh, that could uh, be, a, be a lesson in how we make our complementarities and our common challenges strong to, to keep, bring us together, and even to make our competition the healthy kind which will help us to progress. Uh, I would very much like to be uh, a more active member of the Mekong family, and uh, I think this will come about as we catch up. The Mekong countries represent development gaps within ASEAN, and I think this is also very useful for us. How do countries like Myanmar and Laos, who are not uh, as far advanced as Thailand, how do we work together in order to narrow the development gaps in the interest of all the, di all the different members of the family? So I don't think we have to worry about competition. We have seen, uh, we have been able to show in the instance of rice that uh, the, the fears about competition were exaggerated. And maybe I can uh, uh, move to the, to the vision from Thailand. Um, if you're answering the same question, your vision and, and how you see Thailand's role within it. And the Thank you very much. I would like to support the other leaders which have said previously about their vision on how to get along peacefully, sustainably, and not to allow challenges to diminish the quality and the strength of our cooperation and how we could work together to create peace and sustainability. In Thailand, we believe that water is the essence of life. Therefore, the Mekong River is the main bloodline that brings life to our five nations. The Mekong River will bring about uh, a beautiful environment, rich natural resources essential to life, and create a good livelihood for everyone and contribute to better sustainability and livelihood, good jobs. We will need to work together to use these natural resources and all the resources both on land, in the water, and in the air. These can all contribute to better economic growth. If all five countries could better to create and conserve our environment, we will be the lungs of ASEAN. Besides the environment, we also have very beautiful business environment, which is of great interest to the external partners. In the economic side, we need to promote greater cooperation on all sides. For example, the transportation, logistics, energy, and then also uh, bilateral cooperation. The PPP cooperation is also a model that we should also study. On the side of energy, we see the strength in Laos and also in Myanmar. 
and we have long-standing cooperation with these countries. During the past years, we have signed many cooperation from Laos uh, to the tune of 9,000 megawatt. The ed development is about 70% right now. We are now the uh, transit country for the energy to various other countries in ASEAN. On the area of transportation, we are now at the heart of the region. To the north is the south of China. To the west is the Andaman Sea, the link to South Asia and Europe. To the east is the Pacific, which connects with China, Japan, and Korea. So as you can see, whether it be land, air, or sea, our five countries have great potential, and we could learn from one another to better promote transportation. Lastly, on technology, especially the digital technology, we have said earlier this morning that we need to work together to create ASEAN digital infrastructure. As I understand it, our grouping has great potential and is ready to work on it to connect us with the world. Currently, we are dependent on technology from outside the region, but we ourselves have great potential, great expertise, and we have to use these expertise to link us with the world. We need to work together to have us as a more interesting place for our external partners. And this development, this cooperation, will help to create greater livelihood for all our people and have strong development assisted by technology, and this will great, have a great future for our five countries. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister. And um, I'd like to pick up on uh, your mention there of technology, because, of course, the fourth industrial revolution is a, a big theme of our, of our summit. Um, and Prime Minister uh, Fook, maybe I can uh, return to you because I know that um, uh, Vietnam has been involved in some interesting developments around digital connectivity uh, in the Mekong. And if you look over the, the past 25 years or so of, of, of the Mekong integration efforts, it's very much focused on physical infrastructure, building roads along the east-west corridor and the north-south north corridor. And physical, uh, physical infrastructure is, of course, very important. But are we now moving into a new era where digital connectivity is becoming more important? So perhaps your views on how the fourth industrial revolution changes the nature and the priorities under the Mekong integration um, plans. I share the views that uh, the leaders of Mekong countries have expressed and the vision that we have on peace, on stability, on sustainability, on development is still there. We have physical connection or connectivity like uh, transportation or, or energy. And now we have the advent of the uh, fourth industrial revolution. And I believe that uh, digital connectivity is not somewhat uh, affected by the fourth industrial uh, revolution. It is, in fact, part of that vision. And there's no change to that, but we can change certain modes of cooperation or add certain plans. For example, we are connecting a telecommunication system through uh, three countries, Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. That is the flat roaming plan. The same charge for all three countries on telecommunication fees. And for example, we no longer can depend just on natural resources, but we must rely on uh, innovation, on reform, on creativeness. And that 
kind of new forms of connectivity will make Mekong countries uh, connecting with each other in a more dynamic, more inclusive manner and creating new driver for the integration of Mekong countries. So the connectivity in the fourth industrial revolution affects the development of countries in different uh, aspects and we need to make certain readjustments. For example, the uh, implementation of uh, e-commerce or the dismantling of uh, trade barriers, enhancing uh, connectivity, uh, sharing best practices in economic governance, uh, implementing big plans in the uh, fourth industrial revolution and uh, the four countries have agreed on convening on a biannual basis between Mekong countries on this topic. So we need to adjust on certain aspects, but there's no change in the vision for the five countries of the Mekong countries in the fourth industrial revolution. And it is my belief that the fourth IR will help boost the development of these countries in a faster and more productive manner. Um, for the, the roaming charge that's now flat um, for across the countries involved are Vietnam, Myanmar, Laos and Cambodia. Uh, will we see Thailand join that group? Only three countries. Oh, only three. Uh, but can, would, would Thailand, uh, is, is that exploring the option of, of joining this group? Uh, thank you for that question. Thailand supports this idea which was proposed by the Vietnamese Prime Minister to build a digital network currently we have greater capacity, especially for the cable uh, connection, for example, the landline, uh, undersea, uh, and then also satellite connection. I believe that in the future that this will help to reduce our cost for operation, and then also the maintenance will also be lower. I'm also confident that pretty soon the expense for the consumers will soon come to the same point. We believe that this has been an issue which we have discussed for at least two years and hope that this will become a reality soon. Thank you. Um, Do Su Chi, you mentioned in your comments earlier about the uh, income gaps and the fact that some countries have much higher income than others. Do you, when you look at the fourth industrial revolution, do you see this as something that is going to drive convergence of incomes, or do you worry that it might drive divergence of incomes? Do you think these technologies will be inclusive and empowering, or uh, the opposite? I suppose basically it depends on how you use them, because there are, there's always a plus and a minus to every situation. For example, you uh, were talking about digital connectivity and, and comparing it with the physical connectivity of the um, of the Mekong region. Now, it is possible that digital, digital connectivity, too much emphasis on digital connective, connectivity, could make us overlook the physical connect, connectivity, which is very important because I've noticed that people are all uh, usually on their phones with somebody very far away and not talking to whoever is sitting beside him or her at all. And that means that, in a sense, physical connect, connectivity has been taken over by digital connectivity. So with regard to the income gap, are we going to make the resources of the uh, fourth industrial res res uh, revolution bring us together closer or to drive us further apart? I think uh, I've, uh, I'm confident that the Mekong countries will take the path that will bring us closer together. Because as I said, we have shared cultural values, we have shared histor historical uh, experiences, and that helps us to, uh, to generate empathy among ourselves and to understand each other and to try to help each other more. And uh, I, I do not get the impression that 
the members of the Mekong countries are actually afraid of competition. It's outsiders who seem to worry that competition will drive us further apart. So I think that uh, the uh, narrowing of development gaps will be helped by the fourth industrial revolution, particularly as I have great faith in the ability of our people to take quantum leaps. Uh, and Prime Minister Hun Sen, maybe I can turn to you and uh, uh, for your views on how you think uh, the impact of fourth industrial revolution technologies might change the relationships and the interactions between Cambodia and your, your neighboring Mekong countries. Thank you. According to my understanding, we are not in the situation like the, the collapse of the dam or running against the wall between the fourth industrial the, the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, actually, in reality, <coughs> it has been happening already. Today, we are in the stage let's say the, the traffic from a small road to the big road. So there is no risk like the collapse of the dam in Laos or the collapse of dam in Myanmar. In reality, during the last few years, whether we send a message through what? Now, we send a message. How the way we send message to each other? Let's say in solving the problem, certain a problem, we has been and or within the fourth industrial revolution already. So, I think there is no change of perception or a change in the relation between countries and country, between the neighboring countries, neighboring country, or with a country of outside the region. But on the contrary, what have been, we have been and are having, we will move smoothly, but we have to catch up with those situations. I see that for country um, uh, Mekong or ADMEC, the important thing is, is the ad priority is the connectivity in order to guarantee that our country, all the country, uh, get together uh, in a convenient way. We connect in a physical connective and digital connectivity and within that what is important to that is to the uh, 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 legal facilitation if we do not try to make a legal facilitation the legal gap would be different so the integration and the cooperation let's say that let's say the uh, a customs uh, tax at the border, it still has a problem. Even Cambodia and Vietnam, which needed to sign agreement with each other, before we have to suspend the signing agreement with one. Later, we discuss and agree with each other about the signing not to have a double taxation, not to have double taxation with a neighboring country and a neighboring country. It is necessary in order to respond to the need of integration and the closeness between the neighboring country, in which there is no point that would change the mindset or the relation because of the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, another thing I think that the economic connectivity, there are more sectors, let's say, in the neighboring country in the region, at Mek or Mekong Riparian country, beside the uh, physical connectivity, let's say roads, uh, electricity, or uh, air link, or uh, waterway, we have other issues that need to, to take into consideration. Let's say the use of water at the border, whether we have, we could be have each others. This is very important for the country that have uh, the agricultural relation. Let's say in Vietnam have the water source, in Vietnam, in Cambodia has no water source. 
But sometimes in Cambodia, we have water source, so Vietnam have no water source. So there should be a cooperation of using this water together. So I would like to, to use this uh, situation to become a situation that we can integrate more with each other. Uh, and I think about um, natural disaster at the border. We should have uh, agreement in relation to, uh, in the response to the uh, disaster management. Let's say I used to face such a, a problem at the time of flooding in the remote area of Cambodia. We cannot help the, our people over there. So we have to rely on the armed forces of Vietnam. So the armed forces of Vietnam can evacuate our Cambodian people to the Vietnamese side. That's a, an example I have faced already. Therefore, Cambodia and Vietnam, and I'm now discussing with Thailand too, so that we can sign uh, on the agreement on the uh, cross-borders uh, disaster management. If we do not have such agreement, when they say they need a Wi-Fi, that Wi-Fi, they do not know the border. They just, uh, they just uh, burn uh, over the border. But to put an end to the Wi-Fi so that there will be no Wi-Fi. We start from Cambodia. So Cambodia cross to Vietnam with our agreement. We invade Vietnam. And Vietnam come to Cambodia, we will say that Vietnam invade Cambodia. Or Thai the same way. So we should have uh, made a work in relation to this issue. What is the request of the business people is the trade facilitation in order to facilitate them so that they can do business together. That is to promote the connectivity and do in the way that. And I think that there is no change of perception in the world whether the region about the fourth industrial revolution that they will change uh, the uh, politic, uh, geopolitics or a chain between one country to another or between one group to another. Thank you. I agree with uh, Prime Minister Hun Sen and Prime Minister Tung Lun that uh, countries within the Mekong region, the hard connectivity, our physical, physical connectivity is very important in the four following areas. One is the water resources to ensure the effective fields of water resources and environment and livelihood. But the next is the connectivity in energy, as uh, other leaders have said, for countries with hydropower uh, potential like Laos and others. Next is the transport connectivity, both on roads and in water and in the air. And that's something that we continue to work on that. The highway of these countries are not connected, and that's, that has limitations. And finally, that's another important area of connectivity, that is the training of human resources. That is the most important resources for the application of the fourth IR. So there's both uh, intertwined physical, our hard and soft connectivity. Thank you. Um, thank you, Prime Minister. I'm aware that we have actually run over um, our allotted time, but I feel reluctant to, to bring the session to a close um, quite so soon. Perhaps I can just end with one question um, to all of you, and I think it's an important, interesting question. Um, we are moving into what Professor Schwab uh, regards as a multi-conceptual world where geoeconomic power is, is shifting, uh, new centers of, of, of economic strength are emerging. And here, the Mekong region sits at a very interesting geostrategic location because to your northeast, you have the rise of China. Um, to the west, you have uh, the rise of India. Um, to the south, you have the rise of maritime Southeast Asia, notably Indonesia, but also Philippines and others. And so the Mekong region really sits at a very geostrategic location. And I wanted very briefly, if you can, to hear your thoughts on how you view the geostrategic um, uh, role that the Mekong region will play as you integrate and as you build infrastructure. Um, how can you either be the connective tissue or how do you think about your geostrategic role 
as uh, all the, these big economies all around you also rise uh, and grow. And maybe we can go along in reverse order. Um, DPM Prajan, maybe I can uh, uh, start with you, your views on the Mekong's geostrategic role in the rise of Asia. <coughs> Uh, thank you very much. Thank you that you have seen that our region will in the future become the center and the gravitation drawing people together in the region. The world map is not made by us, but as you can see, we are at the far right of the world. In the middle, there is Europe, and to the west, the left side is um, the Americas. So the new picture that we will see that the Mekong River can act as an important center, which can move and connect the left and the right. And we hope and we are confident that we will be able to act as the connector of both regions. The, we hope to help and connect through physical, digital, and then also the cultural uh, side of connectivity. We are sure that we will be able to help in this aspect. At the geopolitical side, I would like to say that ASEAN especially on its political, economic, and social affairs. We strive to work together to improve the capacity of the human resources to have the digital literacy and help each other and work together to forward and advance the three pillars of ASEAN. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Prime Minister. Um, Dor Su Chi, your thoughts on the Mekong's geostrategic role? Well, Myanmar has always been particularly conscious of our geostrategic position because our ge geopolitical position, if you consider it, we are the ones who are directly between China, India, Southeast Asia, and of course, uh, the, the south of uh, that area. So we've always been sensitive to this, that we have to balance our friendships and our relations uh, as a part of Southeast Asia, as well as the gateway to Southeast Asia from South Asia. We have connections with East Asia through China, with, with of course, Southeast Asia and with South Asia. But uh, we, we feel that uh, the fourth industrial revolution makes it easier for us to make the best of our geopolitical situation because we don't have to depend just on the physical contiguity uh, that was uh, so essential previously from the strategic, strategic point of view. And it in, in a sense, it also makes us feel closer to the other Mekong countries because they now have to share the same sensitivities that we've been facing for a very long time. So I think that um, the change in the, if you like, the geopolitical status of the world brings us closer to the other Mekong countries, in spite of our physical, as I keep emphasizing, the fact that physically we're just on the periphery of the Mekong. Mm, thank you. Um, Prime Minister <coughs> Tong Lun. Thank you. I am of the view that the Mekong region, well, we must not forget that our five member countries, five of us are members of ASEAN. I think that the Mekong region has vast potential and strengths. But the different the differences among us, whether it's political system or economic development level or in terms of culture uh, and traditions, our differences can be used as potential to enhance cooperation for development. We can learn from our strengths, respective strengths, together to advance forward. So I think our Mekong countries have so many potentials that can be utilized. Uh, and in the era of the fourth industrial revolution, 
I am confident that each member country will be able to use it for the benefits of their respective countries and also as collective benefits for the region. Uh, one important thing is the Mekong countries have to cooperate to, for development. And Menamkong, uh, Mekong River originated from Lansang River uh, through the ocean uh, tributaries. The other um, mechanisms, such as the MRC or Mekong Lansang cooperation mechanisms, these complement each other. These mechanisms complement each other. We can exchange views and address issues together, and that's the way forward for us. We cannot um, work separately or in isolation. We have to work together. We we are interconnected in many areas, and we, in terms of geography, we are located uh, together in the same region. We we have long historical traditions that we share. Those countries outside the Mekong region, they can come and visit. Uh, uh, Mekong countries, they will see the diversities and uh, the unique uh, features of each member country. Thank you. Um, Prime Minister Hun Sen, your thoughts on the geostrategic outlook and perhaps whether you have a view on you seeing the region move closer to those on the east or those on the west or those on the south um, in terms of the uh, relationship between the region and the countries here. Where do you see the alliances and the allegiances? How do you see them shifting? For me, what I see, uh, my understanding is that we should start to review from our past. In the past, the Mekong riparian country are not in good term, were not in good term because of uh, the contact of a Cold War during that time. But even though the administration during that time were not in good term, but they cannot prohibit the people from doing business together. Let's say, for example, Cambodia with Vietnam, Cambodia with Thailand, Cambodia with Laos. Cambodia. There's no problem, much problem with Laos, but with Thailand, but with Vietnam. In the past, the role government, government is not in good terms with each another, but the people and people, they do business together. <laughs> they would like to, to live peacefully together. That is a point I can see that. <laughs> the past with the obstruction from the government level cannot obstruct the people from doing business together. Now, at this time, the government paying attention cooperating with each other for the connectivity and facilitate the people in doing business together. So I think that uh, Mekong Riparian country truly will bring good luck for their more than 200 people that live with each other. And it is not competitor. And in the future, we can become a country or community uh, uh, not like a, a block within ASEAN, but we can, in the concrete uh, situation, from the least developed country and try to integrate itself with all ASEAN country. But Thailand and Vietnam, they are more able among the five countries, my five Mekong country, that can help speed up the development, let's say, the human resource development or, or the connectivity. And Vietnam and Thai is more able to help. And another thing is that I should also speak whether it's a World Economic Forum, but uh, we're prohibit from talking politics. But we should uh, take political obstacle out outside from the uh, Mekong uh, Republican country. Otherwise, the five countries that are sitting here are not qualified uh, like a European country. We now have one party, not the pluralism, like uh, what European life will Like only one party is a country. And in my country, we have just a recent election. 
I'm now just four days a new prime minister of Cambodia, the new my Nguyen, after I've been doing this job for 30 years. And Myanmar is more serious than that. That has been a leak as a genocide. But whether you understand about Myanmar, you know Myanmar, that had to solve many challenges in relation to national security, in relation to one group that need to understand about Myanmar. But outside countries, outside the region, they always hit our head. Like they had to follow their way, to follow this and that. At the time, the condition of each country cannot follow that way. And in Thailand, it's more serious. Even though you can uh, announce about the election uh, in uh, February, in coming February. However, that is the right, the decision. Leave that right to those countries to be in peaceful politically, so that to uh, promote uh, their national building. I raise this issue. Don't would like to send a message to all the country, but I think the Mekong Republic are those who are political uh, victim, and I said I'll be outside the region country that do not know our problem, leave us to solve the problem to ourselves. Thank you. <laughs> very very uh, passionate response. Thank you, Prime Minister. Um, and finally, let me end um, with uh, Prime Minister Fook. Uh, your thoughts on the, the geopolitical <clears throat> outlook for the region. I believe that the uh, geopolitics uh, situation uh, the uh, among the major powers, there are certain uh, complex issues, but we are part of the ASEAN community, five out of ten ASEAN countries. So we have unity in diversity. That's, uh, that's a very important principle. And I believe that uh, geopolitics in the fourth IR, what does it mean? First, you must say that we respect each other's political system. Next is to respect independence and sovereignty and uh, integrity of each other in terms of the uh, territory and equality, mutual respect. We are forever brothers and sisters and eternal peace for the people. Those are very important principles for the conduct of uh, affairs in the uh, river and to bring uh, well-being and happiness to the people. And this is the demand for the five countries. Thank you. Great. We have run um, very much over time, for which I apologize. But uh, lots, I think, of very interesting views uh, from the five leaders. Uh, please join me in thanking warmly all of them for sharing their time with us today. Thank you.